Okay, today we're talking about the book in the garden, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. It's a true story. It kind of does the layout and the background of a community, Savannah. I don't really know how big Savannah is at the time, but it talks about all the like elite social parties and all the people that live in Savannah and kind of run the town. Um, but the book's focus is on a murder that happens there probably because it involves like this social status of the town and kind of involves the whole town. So it kind of just goes through that in the trial and before and the background, background stories of everybody. And then it ends when all the trial ends. So the main focus is the murder and the trial that happens in Savannah. Awesome. What would you rate it? I mean, it's a true story. It's hard to, like, fairly rate those because you can't be like, it was a bad story because, I mean, you can't change that. Um, I wouldn't read it again. I'd probably give it a B. I wouldn't read it again. Usually, if you'd read it again or highly recommend it, it gets an A, but I'd probably give it a B. It was extremely entertaining to meet all the people and learn about their way of life and stuff. Um, if they made a true crime episode on 2020 or Dateline, I would definitely watch it. Um, it had all the like good makings of a story, but it's true. It was entertaining. I don't know how much I agree with it, but it kind of talks about like the politics and the bureaucracy in that community. So I give it a B. I'd have to go with something similar. I would do B minus. And because I really did like um, the story. And I thought John Barron's, his writing was good, but he did like his actual words were captivating and easy to follow, especially for a nonfiction book. Um, but some of like the side stories that we thought we're going to come back around and play a role that didn't, they kind of seemed like dead ends after you got done. Um, I just felt like overall it could have been shorter and probably more succinct. That's a hard word to say. Um, and so I say B minus. I wouldn't read it again, but I think it was definitely worth the read. Liz, go. I gave it a B minus too, and for like the same reasons. Like I, it was a true story, right? And so I liked that part of it. And the writing was good, but I don't, don't like the side stories. I like to really, I like a really clear defined, like things get tied up at the end and everything like contributes to the story. But this was just like so many side tangents that didn't end up going anywhere. And it kind of frustrated me, but B minus. I actually gave it an A minus. I actually really liked it for a nonfiction. I feel like nonfiction books are so dry most of the time where it's just, they don't add anything to the story. They just literally go through lists of facts and like, I just read another nonfiction and I thought it was so boring. But this one I was like, I really wanted to know what happened in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like ready to read the rest of it. I would definitely recommend it as a nonfiction. Like, and I thought I liked the part where they're like, like, I don't want to give anything away, but they're like showing things and why they think like during the murder trial they're like talking about clues or things and I thought that was interesting of like their logic in the murder trial and each side's logic and you know the battle between the two I thought some of the little details that they came up with were kind of interesting mm -hmm. so nonfiction goes I would give it an A minus because the other ones I've read that are nonfiction are usually like a C minus. So <laughs> I would say as far as nonfiction, this one is really good. I think if you like nonfiction and uh, murder mysteries, uh, I think you would really like this book. And I think that you should definitely read it. But if you're more I mean, of a fantasy type person or like, you know, crazy dramatic stories that have lots of twists and turns and whatnot, like this isn't the book for you. But it were a lot of like twists. I was really surprised, like Andrea said, it. some of this came out during the trials. Yeah, like, some of that was really interesting. Let's just skip to spoilers so we can like. 
have concise or like full thoughts <laughs> out here with examples. Well, I'll tell you the first thing I thought was odd was that you didn't find out who was murdered until halfway through the book. It was I like guess. over halfway. I'm I had like, so many we, guesses on who we were guessing it, at. Who it got was, I didn't guess it right at all. Mm-hmm. What if you didn't know this was like a murder mystery book though? Like you'd read the first half of the book and you'd have like no idea what was like happening. Piggybacking off of that, what if you didn't know it was the true story? Would you believe it? Like it would, it's so, it's kind of bizarre. Like the yeah, whole some thing. Of the char- two of the characters, like Sean Blee and Joe Odom, I thought were really weird. And the uh, Minerva, they were really weird people. I was like, these people like existed, like they were real yeah. people. Yeah. And I was like, how do these people exist and they're not in jail? Like, how are they getting away with this, like, A, fraud? There's so much fraud going on. Like, I'm sure insurance agents and, like, I don't know, would love to hear about, like, the IRS surely was interested in these people. Mm-hmm. But so, like, I agree, of- with, I agree with you, but I totally hang out with Joe Odom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems quite interesting. Yeah. Like, there are stuff from people business. in the book. There are several people in the book that are interesting, but I'm like, how are they not in jail too? And then, yeah, Minerva. I'm like, who? where do you live? Like, how do you meet Minerva? It's interesting to me what they got away with back then. Like, I don't, I feel like now, there's no way you could have like all these businesses and or all parties these- like that to start with well and he like lived in someone else's house that was for sale for like six months or something and then when the realtor came back he just moved like what? like seriously he's such a smooth talker like how he talked himself out of like the like writing bad checks and like apologized to the people like that was so funny so yeah. liz and andrea clearly like joe odom the best out of all the characters <laughs> in the book I thought he was interesting. He had like a lemon barber. <laughs> like, who has that? He held tours in his rented house, like for money, like in a non-special house. Like he's clearly <laughs> some like ingenious thoughts here. Yeah, he's a con man. <laughs> That's what they would call that these days. You guys call him my book, my good buddy Joe, and everybody else calls him the con man. Who would who would you guys hang out with from the book? I can see Kelly with Minerva. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. The witch. I mean, I probably would like, just could be like, what is this girl up to? I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to just hang out and see what she does with that rat's tail that she found or, you know, this weird dirt, dirt she carries around. Grave dirt. Madeline, what about you? I mean, first one that comes to mind is Luther. He just seems very mysterious. <laughs> one was gonna you know poison everyone i'd want to be their friend so they didn't do that to me. <laughs> okay luther i thought was interesting and the guy with the fake dog yeah him too mm. yeah i forgot about him yeah because you heard a story about him and he never came up again <laughs> <laughs> he was he That's was also fraudulent right what what was he was getting paid to walk a fake dog yeah yeah, yeah. For... That's a good point, though. There was no point to the dog walker guy, and there was no um, point to meeting Luther. I think, I think the author was just like setting the scene and being like, "This is how insane this is. This is the town that they live in, and these are the characters that they interact or, with. So here's how this happened." Or it's like his experience, and then maybe he was writing the book the whole time, and he didn't know that the murder would happen. So he's just writing about the like most eccentric characters he saw and then Mm -hmm. happens and so that becomes the book but maybe I think at at one point in the book he says that um like people knew he was writing a book about Savannah yeah Mm -hmm. and I think this murder just got like looped into it like honestly this book is just a reality tv show that you have to read instead of just watch Mm-hmm. He was writing about like the interesting people, not the old like ladies with their smelling salts that you typically hear about. He was writing about the really 
probably oddballs of the Savannah town. Like none of those people were like normal. I would even think back then they were even weirder I mean, than like the witch earth. That had to be kind of a weird thing back then. There were think. quite a few strange happenings in Savannah. <laughs> yeah. it, but I I do hear about this um murder case or this book or this title quite frequently or like i feel like a lot of people have heard about it and they're like oh yeah i'm like how did how am i just now finding this out it's not that long ago though like he died in 1990 didn't that want to set in the back did i mystery that maybe it said 1890 10 years before kelly was born no, it would have been 1990. I, don't know. <laughs> I, thought, it said, I thought it said 1990. Um, what's weird is I had never heard of this like case before, but I recognized this cover. Like when I saw this image, I had like definitely seen it before, but I had I didn't know what it was about. Well, I had never heard. He died in 1990. Okay. Not that long ago so that's probably why people have heard about it well and i think it was like such a huge case because of the people involved and like how much and for the time and how much money was thrown around mm -hmm. during this and how botched the police work was but i'd never heard of it and then dad went and ran his mouth about it and now i hear about it all the time like well, people bring it up even Anne Anne had heard of it. They've both read it, I think. Dad and like Anne. several of my patients have read it, or like I know several people that are like, oh yeah, I've heard of it, or I've read it. So I mean, what I thought was most peculiar about the whole thing was not the murder, was the fact that John did like just went with people to the most random things. Like he would just. <laughs> Like people he just met, they would invite him over to their house or invite them to go to like the dentist with them. It was the strangest thing how he personally was involved this much with all of the community. That was the other thing. I'm like, okay, so this guy is writing a book about this town and like everybody knows it. And you can have two people in the town that are complete enemies and knows that John hangs out with him, but he'll still invite John to his stuff. Mm -hmm. And everyone just willingly invites this guy knowing he's gonna write about them and like being socialized you think they care a little bit or care that he's hanging out with the enemy and then like dude why are you going with strangers places <laughs> like i get you're from new york but like yeah he's like yeah i'll go to the cemetery late at night with you with a, to meet some girl we've never even heard of that's a witch doctor some guys, yeah with some guys dentures <laughs> yeah and like he went he did go a lot of places with like what were random people and some of them he'd like go places upon them first meeting mm -hmm. and uh, i yeah that is kind of bizarre but it probably is the weirdest thing about the whole thing about the whole book i agree this guy's too friendly he is too friendly and also like i thought it was weird or not weird maybe interesting that all these people talk about how nothing gets out of Savannah. Like when they're like touring the Mercer house after the murder, they don't even talk about the murder, but yet there's a book written about the whole thing. Yeah. Cause they're all like, yeah, we don't let out our dirty laundry or whatever they like allude to during the whole book. But then there's a book. And they all knew about it. Yeah. And they still hung out with it. Yeah, I don't know. It does seem like a fun town though. Like, I would totally go to Savannah and hang out for a weekend. Yeah. I heard Atlanta's where it's at. <laughs> that was a gun with a wind reference. <laughs> Savannah was quite boring in that book. But <laughs> it's, isn't it supposed to be really pretty, though? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be really hot, too. Yeah. I mean, I think Georgia is pretty hot in general. All the time. Well, then the last thing that um, I think is noteworthy is the coincidence of um, his death in the end. The fact that he oh, yeah. dies a month after everything's resolved in the spot where if Danny would have shot him, he would have died. 
Like that is so coincidental that I almost don't believe it. I feel like I need to further investigate to see if that's actually all true. Yes, I agree. That seems very ironic. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> Do you guys really think that Danny fired at him first? That was what I was going to ask. <laughs> I was like, which way did you guys lean in the case if you were on the jury? I'm like, which jury do you belong to? So we got three of them. And I could have seen Danny, like, instigating it. He seemed like he had some anger issues where he would, like, break shit and, like, mm -hmm. I mean, he was, like, wrecking the house. And then that incident with that girl he dated where he, like, flew off the handle. I could see him, like, doing something to that extent where Jim felt, like, threatened and... Like, I could see him, like, pointing the gun at him and being, like, you need to leave, and then he refused, and then, like, because he probably thought Jim wouldn't shoot him, and then he did. I could see that scenario. Andrea, you did not answer the question. <laughs> did Danny fire first? I don't think so. No, there's no gunshot residue. I don't think he did either. You can't tell me there's not one tiny, tiny, tiny drop of gunshot residue on that. Okay, but the expert, like, gunshot guy said that those tests are... They wash his hands. Like, come on, no. There he said that those tests notoriously are, like, inaccurate. Up to 70%. Like, That's a lot of percent. And those old guns had a lot of gunshot residue. Like... I think mostly based on like how Jim like came up with like a different alibi towards the end and was like weird about it. That's why I mostly think that like, yeah, Danny probably was like being a hothead and like threatening him, but I really don't think Danny fired first. Yeah. I have to go, I have to vote the same. I don't think he fired first because um, if he did, I think Jim would have called the police right after instead of waiting a half an hour is kind of like he reached the point of like oh my gosh what the fuck did I just do and then called the police um but I do also think that uh at, what I thought was interesting was at no point did he ever deny killing Danny so like I don't know why they didn't just convict him as guilty and then give him a sentence I don't think it was in malice or pre-contemplated so he didn't deserve the life in prison or yeah the life sentence that they were going for but he never denied the fact that he killed him, so. No, because he, he called and said I shot Danny. Yeah. But I think they were trying to determine if it was manslaughter and, or self-defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yeah. if it was, like, premeditated, like, murder. Yeah. Yeah. I think it wasn't self-defense, but it wasn't premeditated. It was just... A crime of passion. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Kelly, what do you think? I feel like you probably have a different opinion than all of us. I would have probably voted not guilty because of all of it. I don't, I don't know who fired first. And then like the crime scene photos originally, I was like, oh, the pant leg, da, da, da. and then they went through. So I kind of like, I don't think it matters. I think the police botched that and they didn't have to. And Jim Williams had the upper hand on that because the police just treated him like they shouldn't have they treated him oh. like a friend and they didn't do it right so it doesn't matter like but who do you no think fired first in. kelly answer oh, the question i don't, I don't have a clue <laughs> I, think I didn't even know that they were i didn't know that they were lovers until the trial and then i was like wait are we sure like i didn't see that one come in i, I thought it was go ahead andrea i also thought it was interesting he sold a bunch of evidence like the, they mentioned this clock like a thousand times and he sells it between the second and third trial or the first and second he sells this evidence and then they lead you to believe that he pushed it over because he was like an old man but da if danny had pushed it over it would have fallen further or something mm -hmm. but the clock sold like he sold it so that to me was like kind of suspicious i was like and he sold something else. I can't remember what else. But I was like, that's the a chair that was on the panel. Yeah. yeah. He sold like two like important pieces that I was like, how they can't just let him. I don't know. I just thought that was really weird. Like I said, they didn't do the crime scene right. They're supposed to like take all that stuff, 
you know, I don't know. I don't think there was, I don't think you're ever going to find out what happened, but I definitely wouldn't say it's premeditated. It was probably self-defense in some capacity, but I don't know if you get self-defense just off like he was threatening or if like somebody actually has to make a move first. Because mm -hmm. that you're never, you're never going to know. I, what I thought was like really sad about the whole thing was like how much like the fact that like Jim Williams was gay like affected everyone's perception of him in the trial like that was awful like this like guy like couldn't get a fair trial because like because of that and well, I didn't really get that because Danny was also well like I don't know who was gay but Jim slept with Danny so everybody was like oh let's not give him a fair trial but Danny also slept with Jim so shouldn't those like yeah. you know what I mean I think though that it like made people like un like they talked about like the jury members like being uncomfortable and like thinking like appearing to like think less of Jim when they got to that part like and that's well sucky. I guess I guess that makes sense though because that no none of his friends or the town knew he was gay but everyone kind of knew or whatever but everyone kind of knew Danny with the streets and you know what I mean so I think he was held yeah that makes sense he was held to a lesser degree. Or they could, oh, I also thought that they could have been mad because they were all his friends and he didn't tell any of them. And they felt, like, deceived. Yeah, like, he kept that from, or didn't trust them. Like, that was, Danny was, like, the bad kid in town, so they were, like, Whatever. Yeah, and one kid, one lady was, like, super good friends with him and she had no idea. So I'm, yeah. like, maybe she mm -hmm. felt, I don't know, she wasn't on the jury, but, like, maybe some of the people felt, like, yeah. But like how much did they talk about their sex life with Jim, right? Like that's so yeah. weird. Yeah. Right? Like No, I was are weird. How big of a role it played, especially since like the town had so much of different people running around. So I mean, I was surprised that it I don't know, maybe it's just the time, but the fact that it mattered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely an interesting read with um, lots of side stories that they don't go anywhere, but they're fun to read while you do. Yeah. Like the, the guy in the courtroom, like the random guy in the courtroom that like shows up for each trial and like laughs and says random things. Like what would, that was- How is that guy not in jail for like contempt of court? I don't I know. Know. He just said it quietly, but. Sorry, that was another side story. I just remembered Madeline that I was hoping something happened with and it didn't, so. What about the lady driving around doing her makeup in the middle of the night? Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about like, that. never slept. <laughs> we definitely like met the entire town of Savannah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The lady whose daughter like quit college and became a cop instead. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's supposed yeah. to be a ballerina. Yeah. yeah. That was her mother's dream, not hers. Yeah. Also not important for the trial. <laughs> yeah, I don't even lot. know why they talked about the daughter. They were just like people we met, I guess. I don't know. The girl that Danny had sex with cemetery. Oh, yeah. Also not important. I mean, that was kind of important because it gave you more character background on him. Like the type of yeah. like experience. Yeah. When he freaks good out call. in the car and drives really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That one mattered. Okay. But I think overall, it was like a good story. I agree. Yeah. I liked it. Go read it. Worth the read. Definitely for nonfiction. A good story. And there's a movie about it. So you could read the book and then watch the movie. It has Kevin Spacey in it and John Cusack and Jude Law. So we're going to all watch it together. Virtually. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you have it.